Yes, tomorrow. Happy Mother's Day. Yay! All right, all right, you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm just, I'm just laughing because my, my name was spelt a little interesting in the program, and somehow it was an old um, bio of me because we are very lucky to have an LD consultant who's now been there for over a year since a year ago, January, and I think she's in the next room talking about learning disabilities and literacy. Um, thank you for coming. I actually, when I found out the topic of the conference, I was asked to talk about this a while ago, and I was going to talk about it in the winter, and then they scheduled me for this one, um, because this topic really doesn't deal with the theme of the conference, which is literacy. Um, but I've been thinking about how maybe to talk a little about it, because I was asked to explain how my presentation relates to literacy. So I'll, I'll um, see if I can do that before the end a little bit. Um, you should have the handouts. There are the slides, and then there's a bulletin, and they're in your packets, um, and mostly I'll be speaking to those. Um, as I was preparing to talk about this to the group, first of all, in the room, how many of you are um, parents not employed in an educational agency capacity? Okay, and the rest of you are all somehow associated with an educational agency, WISPI or others, law professional law firm. You guys? Attorneys. Attorneys. Ah, a bunch of attorneys. Uh-oh, now, in that, I am not an attorney by trade. I am on the compliance and complaint work group at DPI. Patty Williams is my colleague, and she actually started off by talking about one of the um, uh, letters about independent educational evaluations. I am one of the only non-legal lawyers on that work group, which is puts me in an interesting perspective and unique position, and um, hopefully they like that perspective. I have a lot of background um, in the field. Anyway, today I'm going to provide an overview of special ed legal provisions and the requirements around IEEs, and hopefully I'm going to answer some of the frequently asked questions that you might have. Um, I, I base that on a lot of the cases, things hearing officers have found, some of the OSEP, the Office of Special Ed. I will try not to speak in um, acronyms, but if I do use them, please feel free to call me on it and say, can you tell us what that means? OSEP is the Federal Office of Special Education Programs. Um, so what I've tried to do is bring in some inter stuff about the clarifications that have been made either through federal government clarification guidance or case law. Um, I am going to ask that we hold questions till the end. And the reason for that, we're going to stop taping when we get to that. Often questions and conversations around independent evaluations get extremely case specific. And I, I really did not feel comfortable having those kinds of things taped. So we'll stop at the end. I only have 15 slides, so there'll hopefully be time for questions. All right, so let's first start at the beginning. What is an IEE? And Patty, I know, kind of explained this a little bit in her, in her first thing at lunch today, but um, an IEE is an evaluation conducted by a qualified examiner, so the person has to be qualified, and who's not an employee. That's where the word independent comes from. It should not be someone affiliated with the school district. Um, parents always have the right to get their own outside evaluations um, and have the district consider the information from them. But what I'm going to talk about today are called IEEs, capital I, capital E, capital E, independent educational evaluations, which is a special kind of outside evaluation. Um, uh, independent evaluation is specifically when a parent thinks that um, the special education evaluation of their child that was done by the school district under special education law has not identified the true nature of the child's disabilities or their needs. So that is the specific time when you would, uh, when we're referring to an IEE. And if that is the case, then parents have the right to an independent educational evaluation at no expense, at public expense. Um, so, P 
parents can get a publicly funded independent educational evaluation when either the parent disagrees with a special education eligibility decision, whether their child is or isn't a child with a disability under special education law, when they disagree that the evaluation did not properly identify the child's needs, when they believe that the information from the evaluation wasn't comprehensive enough to help develop an IEP. An IEP is an individual, individualized educational program which is developed um, after a child is found eligible. So first a child is found eligible and then if they are eligible for special education, a plan is developed to address the needs of the child. And finally, um, an IEE could be po potentially appropriate if the parent believes that the information in the evaluation was not sufficient to determine an appropriate placement. But it's really specific to the evaluation. Um, so just going through some of the other requirements, um, parents are entitled to only one independent educational evaluation at public expense each time the district does an evaluation. And under special education law, districts do an initial evaluation the first time a child's evaluated, and then at least once every three years um, conduct a reevaluation unless the parent and the districts agree that one is not needed. But if a district doesn't do a reevaluation, then the parent wouldn't, you know, necessarily be um, able to get an IEE if they had one on the first evaluation. We've had a couple of cases around this um, related to getting one IEE, and I'll just give it an example from a Wisconsin due process case. Um, in this case, the parent had had an independent evaluation, and it was several years later, and the parent disagreed with some changes to the IEP that were done, changes to the services in the IEP. Um, what happened was the district said, you know, um, we're not going to do this because we're due for a reevaluation. We need to be allowed to do that. And um, the and you already had one. And we'll do a reevaluation. And then if you don't agree with that, we can because it was pretty much three years, so it's just about three years. And the hearing officer agreed that the parent had already had an independent evaluation almost three years ago after the last evaluation and therefore could not have another independent evaluation and needed to let the school district do a reevaluation before they could get an independent evaluation. Um, parents are encouraged but not required to notify the district. And there's been a lot of cases around this where parents will submit a bill for an independent evaluation, never told the district they were getting one. Um, and it's very clear, case law and guidance says that parents don't need to notify the district. Um, one, in one case in Wisconsin, we had a complaint where the uh, district did not properly respond to a parent's request for payment because the district said, you know, um, you never told us that you disagreed or what you disagreed with. So we're not going to give it to you because we don't believe that you disagree. You didn't tell us that you disagreed. And the finding was that the district improperly, that the parent really did have the right to an IE and the district should have either paid it or taken the parent to a due process hearing to determine that their evaluation was appropriate. Um, I'm going to talk about communication issues a little bit more later because a lot of um, the issues around IEEs or why parents need IEEs are one caused by poor communication and then afterwards, you know, get into issues around communication. So we'll talk a little about that throughout. So um, parents have the right to an independent educational evaluation at no cost to them unless um, a due process, the, the district requests a due process hearing to either prove that its own evaluation was appropriate or that um, the independent evaluation that the parent did get did not meet the district's criteria, and I'll talk about district criteria in a while too because there's been a lot of case law around that as well. Um, one I think that I will talk about right now is that um, 
a situation where the parent didn't lost their right to an independent evaluation, and it had to do with not providing consent for evaluation. Um, so in the state of Wisconsin and in most states, when a district wants to do an evaluation, the first step is reviewing the existing information and deciding if any additional information is needed. And that process of doing that is supposed to involve the parent. It has to involve the parent. All IEP team participants um, are part of that process. And during that process is the time where you talk about, so what do we think is needed to do a comprehensive evaluation? Because all evalu initial evaluations, all evaluations should be sufficiently comprehensive to identify the child's needs, to determine whether they're eligible services for services, and to identify the needs in such a way that you can develop an appropriate IEP after the evaluation's done. Um, if the team believes that additional testing is needed as part of either an initial or a reevaluation, they have to ask the parent for consent for assessments. And generally, we say it's not a pick and choose kind of thing. And there's a reason that we do that. And part of it is when someone feels, whether it's a parent or district person, feels that additional information is needed in an area, that information is needed to do a comprehensive evaluation. And so parents either consent to all or nothing. There are variations across states where parents can insist, I don't want this particular part done, so I'm not going to, and they'll take it, and the district will then take it off the list of things to be done. There have been mediation agreements where agreements have been made that certain things won't be assessed. Um, what the courts have consistently found is that when a parent, when a, a district wants to do some assessment and the parent says, no, you can't, and then the parent later goes and wants an independent evaluation because they want someone else to look at those areas, that that parent has lost their right to an independent evaluation. So I just wanted to let you know that for those of you who are thinking about, well, I don't want you guys to do this. I want someone else to do it. So you guys do your eval and then I'm going to get an independent evaluation afterwards um, because I don't trust how you're going to do that kind of thing. So just be careful around those things. And, and that's where communication comes. And obviously, parents always have the right to get an outside evaluation at their own cost or insurance cost and bring it to the district. Um, let's see. Another thing that relates to this is the district has to be allowed to complete the evaluation. There was um, an interesting um, complaint that we had a number of years ago where the district started an evaluation and they had three meetings. It took three meetings to complete the evaluation. They had some outside folks that had come in that the parents had requested. Um, and so they had three different meetings, and the meetings um, went over a period of, they started in the end of June and ended in the middle of August, so a month and a half worth of evaluation meetings. And then after the second meeting, um, the parent felt that what was being discussed and the information then presented by evaluators during that meeting was not okay, and they went and had the child evaluated outside. And after the decision was made in August, presented the district with a bill for an independent evaluation. And the IEE was completed the day after the second meeting. The decision was that that parent could not get reimbursed for that evaluation because the district hadn't finished the evaluation yet. And the definition of what it means to finish an evaluation means that the report is done. So an evaluation is over when there is a final evaluation report that has the findings of the IEP team um, and the decisions made. And I'm going outside my line. Am I OK? All right. So basically, if there's I'm going to hold questions to the very end, um, just for the purpose that I said before. And I'm sorry, I usually don't do that. But in this case, I'm going to. Thank you for indulging me. Um, so, what should a district do? Let's kind of talk, about, talk through the process a bit. Um, when a parent requests 
an independent evaluation or says, I want to get an evaluation, tell me about this. Without a necessarily delay, the district must do one of two things. Either provide the information to the parent about how to get an independent evaluation, what the district's policies are, district's criteria are. They also must provide a list of um, possible evaluators to the parent um, uh, and basically tell the parent how to get one promptly. Or they need to um, request a due process hearing to prove that the parent, um, that their evaluation is appropriate. Now, what is timely is a very interesting question, and the examples are all over the place, and I'm just going to give you a couple. Um, for example, there's one, and most of these are idea complaints, so we had enough examples in our own state that I drew from pretty much all of them. Um, there was one example that said that it was timely even though it took more than two months to finish responding. And the reason was that the parent requested an independent evaluation. Within two weeks, the district did respond, gave a list, gave their policies. The parent and district agreed on an outside evaluator. Um, but the evaluator was not available. So the district contacted them and tried to make the arrangements to have the evaluation conducted. The person was not um, available. And the parent did not want anyone else on the list. And it took the parents a while to find someone that they found acceptable. Um, they then gave the person's qualifications to the district. Uh, within less than two weeks, the district said, yes, this person will meet the qualifications, no problem. That process took um, over two months, but the decision was, given the specific situation in the case, that that wasn't too long. Um, I'll, I'll give one that was even longer than that where it wasn't too long. One was between June and November, and it was determined, so five months, and it was determined not too long. And the reason was that the parent um, requested specific multiple evaluators and also requested that the child be observed in the class by an outside person of their choice. Now, this was a request was in June. And to observe a child in school, the, the child wasn't in summer programming. They had to wait till the fall. Plus, there were uh, quite a few evaluators the parent requested. The district agreed. They brought them all in. They paid for them. But the schedules were such that it took till November to finish the evaluation. And in that case, again, it's a very long time. But under the circumstances, it was OK. Um, I'll give one example where a month was too long. So that we decided in our complaint decision that a month was too long. And the reason for that was um, the parent requested an IEE. The district responded in one week. They gave their policies and their, and their um, criteria. But they said, you know, we're in the process of updating our list. We'll give it to you when we finish. And that wasn't for a month. And the department's decision was the district should have had that information available in a much more timely way. And that was too long to make a parent wait to get all of the required information they're supposed to get. So there's huge amounts of variation in these. And they're always very case specific as to what is too long. This is another thing that we sometimes have confusion about. Um, First of all, a parents can request any kind of evaluation that would generally be performed to assess special education eligibility or the needs of the child. Um, this includes any kinds of assessments that the district would normally do, testing, um, observations, analysis of students' work, other things like that. Um, an independent evaluation could also just consist of a review of what the district did. So all that information needs to be made available. Um, the same criteria then apply to the district's evaluations and evaluators. They also apply to independent evaluations. Um, and the criteria must be directly related to ability. And I'll talk a little about those things on the next few slides. Some examples. Um, I can give you is that in, in another state, there was a, this was on a hearing in another state, uh, the district had a list of evaluators. 
the parent said, I don't want that one, I want someone else, and the district refused and instead used one from their list or told the parent they had to and arranged for that. And the, um, the parent felt that the evaluator that the district chose, even though they weren't an employee of the district, was not unbiased. In that case, the parent took the district to due process and the hearing officer said, no, you have the right. You know, what, what you need to do is give the parent qualifications. And the person the parents selected all met the same qualifications. They had the same licenses. They were skilled. Um, and so there was no reason that the district should not have allowed the parent to use an otherwise qualified evaluator. And those are some examples of that. Um, another interesting one, um, and uh, Patty talked a little bit about a, a one variation of the answer to the question, which is how what kinds of um, assessments can a parent get and what is okay for an independent evaluation. So in one case, um, a hearing officer ruled that a parent did not have the right to an independent evaluation just because the parent did not feel the district's evaluation was sufficiently comprehensive. It didn't include all of the tests the parent would have wanted um, to be given or all of the assessments. Um, because as long as the evaluation is sufficient, sufficiently comprehensive, in other words, it covers all the areas it needs to and uses appropriate ways of addressing that, in most cases, hearing officers will find the district's evaluations appropriate. Now, in the example Patty gave today um, in a letter from the Office of Special Ed, OSEP, from federal government, um, she said that in that case, OSEP said that, you know, parents have the right to ask for things that weren't part of the district's evaluation. And I don't think this is totally against what I just said, because Patty also mentioned that she thinks the reason for that had to do with whether the eval was sufficiently comprehensive. And so when there's a disagreement and a parent wants more evaluation because they said the district didn't do enough evaluation or I wanted that test and they didn't do that test so I wanted independent evaluation to get the test I wanted. Um, if that ends up at a hearing, if a district says no and goes to a hearing, the likely thing that a hearing officer will do will be to look at whether the evaluation was comprehensive, did it address the areas, um, were the evaluation tools used appropriate for addressing those areas rather than just specifically which tests or was it what the parent wanted. So it's a little more complicated, I think. Um, and I thought it was interesting that Patty brought that letter up. So it was a topic I was going to talk about. So districts can have criteria around a bunch of things. The real critical um, thing is the last, the last few lines, as long as it doesn't prevent a parent from obtaining an IEE. For example, um, district's policies can say independent evaluation should occur within just geographical area and within this cost to the degree to which it wouldn't prevent a parent from getting an IEE. And I'll give a bunch of examples around each of these areas, um, or a few examples at least. Um, what, the, what OSEP's guidance around this has said is that in all cases, districts can set policies, criteria, they can set these um, boundaries around cost control and other things of independent evaluations. However, they cannot unilaterally impose them, meaning that, for example, the example I gave before where the parent wanted to use an otherwise qualified evaluator that was within the cost limits of the district. There was no reason a district could impose a specific list of people. Or say, because this person is located 10 miles outside of our geographical boundary that we say the evaluators need to be located, that you can't have that person. They have to allow parents to prove circumstances that warrant an independent evaluation by someone outside of the location that the district has set by in some cases, qualifications, although that we'll talk about that separately, or cost. Um, as far as qualifications go, districts do have the right to impose the same requirements, particularly when um, those qualifications are 
um, known to be required. For example, to administer certain psychological assessments. Districts can say you must have a licensed school psychologist do this. Or to administer certain educational testing that you must have someone who is a licensed special education diagnostician or teacher or psychologist do this. However, there are some evaluations that don't require um, a license, a particular license. And to then for a district to put qualifications on a parent's choice of evaluator that they wouldn't impose on themselves is inappropriate. Some examples are assistive technology evaluations. There isn't a license for that. Um, and there are many people who are qualified to do that that a district might pull in. And so if the parent pulls in someone similarly qualified, if that is the question that's being asked, um, the parent should be allowed to do so. So flexibility. Flexibility is a big word around that. A couple of other examples. Um, let me look for an, a fun one. We talked about uh, um, I'll give one example where the court actually said the district had the right to impose some, impose some cost limits. And one was the district had a, a um, list of eligible um, folks and they had cost requirements and the parent chose to go outside of the boundaries and outside of the cost um, and uh, couldn't really explain why they, they wouldn't consider any of the people within the geographical boundary. And the court in that case found, the hearing officer found, that the parent really needed to consider. There were plenty of people within the area who were qualified and would do an evaluation for within the cost. So therefore, the district only had to reimburse the parent for the maximum allowable cost and not the whole thing. Oops. OK. So I think I went over most of this already, um, that districts can set policies, but they have to be flexible. Parents have to have the right to show the reasons for them. Um, even if a district feels like a parent hasn't demonstrated reasons, they still only have two choices. Either they pay or they go to a hearing. So even when a district may legitimately have a reason for saying, no, you took your child out of state and you're asking us for airfare and all that other stuff, and there are qualified evaluators in our state that you could have used, we're only going to pay the maximum price and we're not going to pay your transportation costs, um, they would have to go to a hearing to not pay. So I, I think always with any of these things, when there is a disagreement and the parent is otherwise um, eligible to get an IEE, that um, you either go pay it or go to hearing, and that's how those work. Let's see. Um, we had an interesting case about um, district policies, um, and this was in 2004. We haven't had very many complaints in, about independent evaluations lately. We had a whole lot of them um, for a while and then haven't had too many. But one was very interesting, and I'll just read the district policy to you. Um, if the total cost of an IEE exceeds the district cost criteria, and if in the district's sole judgment there's no justification, the cost of the IE will only be funded up to the district's maximum allowable costs. Um, also, the district is not responsible for reimbursement of travel costs or other related costs um, of a parent pertaining to arrangements for or the provision of an IEE. And that was the district policy. Um, the parent uh, filed, a, a complaint was filed saying that the district's policy was not appropriate. It wasn't necessarily about a case. And the department found that that policy was not appropriate. And why do you think it was not appropriate? Because it didn't include what? The bold, the bold word. Flexibility. 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 It didn't have any options for you must explain, um, you know, we'll consider this, we need to consider everything on a case-by-case -case basis. There was no um, flexibility. Um, so the finding was that the district could not enforce its policy unless it went to due process. And the, uh, we said that they had to change their policy and incorporate language that would be flexible. Um, I mentioned already travel expenses. I think I mentioned classroom observations. Um, when and how payment occurs, again, these have to be flexible as far as 
who gets paid, when they get paid, case by case basis are always the situation. And in the end, for all of these criteria and considerations, um, you cannot have any criteria or policies that would inhibit a parent from getting an IE. The most interesting case I read about payment had to do with um, a parent who is very poor. And, um, the, the, and this is not a Wisconsin case. Um, the case in this state was that the state had, the district had a policy that parents had to get the IE and then get reimbursed. And the parent said, I need you to pay the person up front for the evaluation because that's what they expect and I don't have the money to do that. I cannot pay and get reimbursed. I need you to pay directly this person. And the district says, no, that's not our policy. You can imagine what was decided. The decision in this case of the hearing officer was that the district's policy, because the parent couldn't afford to pay up front, in this case was inappropriate and unreasonable. So again, reasonableness, flexibility are always how um, cases are de defined around this. Um, IDEA also, the federal law also does not talk about how the information from an independent evaluation should be shared. A lot of times written reports could be shared in per person. However, um, districts are not required to pay for independent evaluators to attend an evaluation meeting unless the district agrees that having the person there is necessary in order to share the data. Um, so just because someone wants a person to be there, parents can always bring who they want to meetings, but unless the, the district agrees that it is a critical and important way for the information to be shared, um, that they don't necessarily have to pay for an independent evaluator to attend and they can say, we'd like it in a report. Um, and there have been a number of court cases that decided on either side of that depending on the situations. So the next thing is consider, and I'm looking at my clock because I want to make sure I leave about 15 minutes for questions. What time? Are we, we're done at 1.30. One one Thank you. I'm good. Doing good. Um, so another big thing is what does the district do after? So after the independent evaluation is done, the requirement is that the district must consider. And the word consider is always an interesting word. What does that mean? Well, federal law does not explain what consider means, but we do have um, some OSEP guidance and some case law that helps us. So um, what I did is I'll summarize that quickly for you. Generally because an IEE always involves decisions that affect eligibility and programming, particularly in Wisconsin where IEP teams make all those decisions, eligibility, um, programming, and placement, it makes sense that the IEP team should be the group that considers. So first of all, it should be done during an IEP team meeting is what we say, or the IEP team must consider it. Um, in an OSEP letter, the, the most recent one I could find that addressed this was from 1995, but it, I read it and it seems to still make sense. So um, what they recommended consider should mean is that the IEP team, one, reviews the IEE, two, discusses the results and the possible implications it might have on either evaluation or IEP programming, and to the extent that um, the findings are not agreed with or adopted, there should be some discussion of the basis of a disagreement. In other words, why we don't think this IEE would change anything. Another related element to that is, is um, documentation required. And I hope you don't mind I'm not speaking directly to the slide, only because I always find it frustrating, so I hope this is my aside. Um, so if, if you are writing notes or have questions in your little sidebars. If you want me to go over anything that I didn't go over sufficiently on the slides, let me know. But I figure you could read the slides and I'm talking about things that relate to them. Um, so documentation is another question. In order to prove that you considered it, do you need to document? Again, federal law does not say anything about the requirement of documenting 
the findings from an independent evaluation. However, um, they strongly and we strongly recommend that it be documented in some manner. Where and how that occurs is really um, up to the district. Um, I have some thoughts about that, but that's my own personal thoughts. Um, and I can share some of those with you also. But some of the things that OSEP has suggested that districts document is how the IEE report or results were made available to the team, um, when and the context it was discussed, if no changes are made as a result, a summary of why the findings or recommendations were not adopted somewhere. And of course, if the independent evaluation results in some amendment or different kinds of placements or <laughs> services, that would obviously be documented in an updated eval report or IEP. And my suggestion is if you do this during a meeting, I always, when districts call me about this, I always encourage them to just hold another meeting. Hold an IPT meeting, check the box when it says purpose, put other to discuss IEE. And however you normally in your districts, the districts that people are in, sometimes um, they use the present level page, but if it's just an evaluation, they might just attach an additional page that just summarizes these things. And that would be enough. So you have a cover sheet that you had a meeting and an additional page as to what you reviewed and what the suggestions were. Sometimes if the decision is made to amend the evaluation report, you would just amend the evaluation report and update the report and have a, a new report attached to it. That's, those are some thoughts. Again, nothing's required um, and there's nothing specified. But um, So a couple other questions. You guys can probably answer these by now. <laughs> Does a parent or have to use an evaluator recommend by the district? No, good. Um, does a district have to pay for the evaluator to attend the meeting? No, we chatted about that already. Must the independent evaluation cover all areas addressed in the evaluation? No, just the areas the parent is disagreeing with need to be covered. Um, does the parent need to let the district know they plan to get an IEE? No, they don't. Um, and if the parent doesn't inform the district, does the district still have to pay? No. Yes, if the if if the parent if they're eligible to get one. So the only time that a district can say no without going to due process is if the parent isn't eligible to get an IEE. In other words, the district hasn't finished their evaluation. Um, or the parent already got one. In those cases, we had a couple of complaints where the district said no, and we said you didn't have to go to a due process because the parent was not eligible for an IE, so you had the right to say no without going to due process. Um, and can the parent and district agree to alternative options after a parent has requested an IEE? And I want to talk a little bit about this one um, because we always run into issues around what does it mean to have discussion and have agreement. And Patty mentioned also, when parents and districts agree to things, it's OK. Um, what do you think the answer to that one is? Yes, people can always agree. And you know this relates to communication and relationship. All of these things relate to communications and relationships. And I always, part of me gets unhappy when I'm asked to talk about what I call reactive subjects. To me, independent evaluations are reactive, meaning they're a way to react to something that went wrong. Whether it's the evaluation itself went wrong or the relationship went wrong, people ask for these things because something's not right. Um, and so I always want to suggest that special ed law puts a good process in place, and that process involves parent involvement. And I always encourage no matter which side calls me on the phone at DPI parents, districts, a lot of times we spend a lot of time talking about relationships. How do we work on the relationship? How do we communicate in a way that the other party will understand? When I talk to districts, how can you communicate? Have you heard the parents' concerns? How can you communicate in a way that helps the parent understand what your legal obligations are as well as that you understand their concerns as a parent and what they're saying, and is there a way you can address them? Same thing with parents to talk about what are language that districts 
will help you express yourself, and I know that's where a lot of the WISPI and FACETS folks really are helpful for helping those conversations. Um, so when a, a parent requests an IEE, the district must timely respond by giving the information. And what we suggest and what all the case law suggests, even if you want to have a conversation, you should still give the information timely. Tell them how to get it, give them a list, and say, hey, can we talk about this? Can we get together and talk about your concerns? Um, so there's nothing wrong with that, but we do encourage that in the end, if the parent wants an IEE, they have the right to an IEE. And we always encourage you to not make giving the information contingent upon getting information or having a meeting. And there's a lot of cases that involve districts that withheld the lists and the qualifications until the parent agreed to a meeting. All of those cases have found that parents had the right to an IEE and withholding it is not what is intended by timely giving the parent their right. Um, usually districts can't initiate reevaluations in response to an IEE. There have been a very small number of cases, and one I shared earlier, where the child was due for reevaluation anyway, and the court said, let the district do the reeval. They were due. In fact, they're overdue. One of the cases was, you know, four years instead of three years. Um, but by and large, a district can't say, Instead of an IEE, we're going to initiate a reevaluation. District can suggest that. How about we do this? How about we bring these people in? And I've heard this a lot lately, where a parent will say, I want an independent evaluation. And the district will say, why don't we initiate a reevaluation? We'll bring those people in. We'll pay for them. But let's not put it in this process. And I would always encourage parents that if a district is doing that, they're giving exactly what it is you want, but in a way that hopefully is a better thing for your relationship. And so think about it before you say, no, I don't want that. I want an in independent evaluation. So these are some things. So if the parent agrees to talk about the matter with the district, or the parent agrees to a solution that the district is proposing that might address their concerns, that's great. But in the end, if the parent still wants an IEE, the parent has a right. And the district at that point must either say yes or go to due process. So um, where can get more information? Life is good, time-wise. Um, these are some sources. I wish I could show you the department's page, but I can't because the internet here is just not allowing us to get on any of these sites for some reason. Um, but we do have a page on the parent page. There's lots of links to other organizations. Also, WISPI and FACETS folks are amazing resources for um, not only giving information about your rights, parents' rights around IEEs, but also suggestions for organizations you can call that might be able to help you with who can do them. Um, I know, shockingly, directors of special ed, but a lot of them do have quite extensive lists of potential outside evaluators. Family doctor. Um, you know, the only caveats there is people need to understand what an educational special ed eval is versus um, not. Um, as far as literacy goes, I promised I would address that, and then I'm going to have the gentleman shut off the camera. Um, so this was a hard one for me about how independent evaluations address literacy. How would you get an independent evaluation around literacy? And the reason that I find this to be a challenging question to ask is most of the time, parents' concerns around literacy are more programmatic. They're about how their child's being taught to read. It's, it's often dis, um, arguments <coughs> or discussions or disagreements around methodology. So you know, independent evaluations really only apply when the crux of the decision around eligibility focused on reading, like learning disabilities. Um, or a child's, whether a child did or did not have a disability-related need in the area of reading, rather than programmatic issues, which curriculum are we going to use, or, or what interventions are we going to use, those are really more appropriately done through the IP process and aren't really necessarily related to independent evaluation. So I guess that's the best I can say about that.